go back into chapter 15, and we'll spend some time thinking about IR, mass spec, and then we'll talk about NMR a little bit today, get the sort of uh, you know, preliminary stuff out of the way, uh, in, in the sense of trying to use this stuff. How are we going to start using this stuff to be able to do organic synthesis and to be able to use the techniques for what they're really used for in reality, which is making sure you have the right stuff. You do some chemical reaction, and you end up hopefully with the right material, and we can check that. So what we'll do this morning is very quickly talk about context and think about Friday. Um, it's the usual length of test. The IR NMR stuff is on the end. You have that last page as the spec sheet. And if you can use that, you're in good shape. Um, IR is all about functional groups. This is what you should be getting out of this by now. Infrared spectroscopy is all about functional groups. And if you take the infrared spectrum of a material, you get some idea of whether it has hydroxyl in there, whether it has a double bond in there, whether it has a ketone aldehyde, stuff like that. Uh, at this level, it's got some limited use. We do have many numbers on that sheet, but they're all kind of families. They all belong to similar sort of uh, functional groups. And so my expectation is by Friday, you ought to be able to look at something like this and be able to give me some opinion as to what the actual compound is. All right? But this is the very beginning of this. What we'll spend time on is then working towards NMR. And I will touch on this today. And for those of you who enjoy solving puzzles, this becomes really enjoyable, I think. Um, and it gives you the sort of rounded view of, of what we can do with this technique and what we can do with, the, with this subject. Um, these graphs are very much more complicated. But on the flip side, much more complicated means much more useful. And we'll see this for the second test. And by the second test, we'll be able to put it all together. IR, mass spec, NMR of two different types, carbon and proton, and then hopefully UV vis as well. Um, and you'll see questions like that on the second test. We talked about mass spec on, on um, what is today, Wednesday? Yeah, OK, we talked talk, we talk about the mass spec on Monday. We talked about the fact that they're fairly cumbersome instruments, mostly. Uh, they give you numbers about masses, and they give you numbers about fragment masses. Um, the idea that we hit the molecule with a beam of electrons, and it tends to blow them apart. But they break apart in, in, in sort of rational ways. The molecule just doesn't split up completely. It'll break apart in a rational way. And we can form charged species, and charged species tend to go through the instrument at different rates and different speeds. And we'll see them manifest at the end as a chart, as a graph, as we call it, maybe a mass spectrum. And, and they tend to look like this. And the numbers at the bottom are what you're after. The intensities here do mean something in terms of how much you get. We did label a base peak, and we did sort of talk about M plus and M plus 1. And we, started, we ended up with M plus 2, and I'll reiterate that today. Uh, but the whole point here is that it allows you to talk about, certainly about the mass of the molecule. What is the mass of my molecule? Um, but also about fragments and where the fragments would break logically is something that you should be aware of. So we talked about benzene a little bit. Um, the idea that benzene is a, is a fairly stable molecule, and so when it breaks apart, it seems to here give the um, M plus is the, actually the uh, base peak. Okay, It doesn't break apart too easily, but it does have smaller fragments down to the left. If you look down the left here, benzene will break apart gradually as it goes through the mass spectrometer into rational fragments. Um, there's the spectrum of benzene. It is somewhat complicated. You will not be able to do much more than tell me what M plus is. And you might be able to have a go at what some of the smaller signals are, but not in great detail. Yeah, Because we haven't talked about that type of chemistry where a benzene ring fragments. What we have talked about is how alkanes are put together. And we talked about radical stability. We talked about the idea that primary radicals are better than methyl radicals. And a secondary is better than a tertiary. And a tertiary is better than a, sorry, a secondary is better than a primary. And a tertiary is better than a secondary. And this sort of manifests itself in the mass spectrum. These molecules will fall apart to give you the best possible radical if they can. So we said over here, M plus, which is the molecular mass of the molecule, is no longer the base peak. Okay? This one falls apart in the mass spectrometer in logical ways to give you these smaller fragments. And the base peak here actually is where an ethyl group splits off, and you have a propyl and an ethyl piece. And that makes sense when you get two propyl radicals as opposed to one, one sorry, you get two uh, primary radicals as opposed to one primary and one methyl. Uh, you can see here a, a whole bunch of other signals down here on the left, and that's when the smaller pieces start to break into smaller pieces again. And if you're a mass spectrometrist like Dr. Lescu, for example, you'd be able to look at that chart and you'd be able to identify every single signal on there, and that's very, very useful. Now, what we'll talk about today is, is sort of the use maybe of this stuff in things like forensics and things like law enforcement. Um, more and more sort of police departments will have a, a GC mass spec, and if you're under the influence of something, they want to find out, they'll take a blood sample, they can shoot it through the mass spec, and they can see if it's what it is, okay? Because every molecule has its own unique pattern. And if you have a library of those patterns in your uh, computer that's attached to the GC mass spec, you can work out whatever the, the sort of illegal substance was. Um, we talked a little bit about this. I'm not so worried about this, but it, it is an accurate technique. You can tell the difference between 72 and 70, or 71 and 72, right? You can really tell detail. And by the end of today, we'll see that you can do lots of detail here 
by using high resolution mass spectrometry. Um, these are molecules that are related, they're alkanes, that we're looking at the M plus and the M plus one signal based on isotopes, they're not that interesting, okay, we will see a lot of interest with isotopes of carbon in the near future and also isotope of hydrogen when we do NMR spectra, but right here, that's just FYI, why do you see two signals there? The answer being M plus is the molecular mass and then M plus one is, is an isotopic um, idea. Important ones that you should be concerned about. This is just to make sure people are keeping up with this stuff and know what it's about. Um, chlorobenzene. Chlorobenzene has two M plus signals to the right of the spectrum. And it also has a signal here at 70, what looks like 77, 78. That signal right there is where the chlorine broke off. Now, this isn't chlorine behaving as a leaving group. This is chlorine breaking off, maybe as a radical. But that's a sensible place to, to break that molecule because it's, it's not the strongest bond. What you're really interested in here, for, the, for my class and for the future, is these two signals to the top right. And those two signals are the molecular mass of the molecule, but there are two of them. And this manifests, so this is, this is a manifestation of the fact that chlorine in nature exists as two different isotopes. So they differ by the number of neutrons, okay? Therefore, they have different atomic masses. And if you add up those two different atomic masses, you get two signals. And you can see very easily here, a three to one ratio of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 shows up exactly as that. Yeah, you can see here the, the biggest signal is for chlorine 35. Why is it bigger? Because there is more chlorine 35 in nature and therefore more of the molecules of chlorobenzene have that atom in there. To the right of that is M plus two. M plus two simply because you have an atomic mass unit difference of two between chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. On the right you'll see a smaller signal, in this case it's for a, a 24% and so this is less abundant, uh, but that's exactly why. Anybody got any questions about that? Nothing too tricky about that. If you understand what an isotope is, you should be able to handle this. So bromine, and I'm looking at molecules and systems that are important to us because they're good leaving groups. We don't have to put them in here. Uh, we're able to use them in, in Grignard reagents, for example. And we can label them, and we can follow them in mass spectrometry. So if you had made bromobenzene, which you don't know how to do yet, but you will fairly soon, you need to check it's the right stuff. And you might take its infrared spectrum. But the infrared spectrum might not be that different to chlorobenzene. And you might take the NMR spectra a little bit later, and the NMR spectra might be identical to chlorobenzene, or, you know, very, very close. Mass spec is the best way to go, because mass is a different, a chlorine is a very different mass to a bromine, and you'll see that in this spectrum. So bromobenzene is a little bit different to the chlorobenzene. Again, you get two M plus signals on the right-hand side. What is this here? What do you think this is? It's a consistent technique, so what is that? That's the benzene ring, where the benzene ring broke off as a radical cation. So you can measure that, and that's going to be consistent. So if you see that signal, chances are you have a benzene with something attached to it. On the right-hand side of the spectrum here, we have two signals, and they're approximately the same height, or in the, in the language here, relative abundance, the same intensity, the same abundance. And that's based on the fact that bromine in nature has two isotopes, two major isotopes, bromine uh, 79 and bromine 81. They differ by two atomic mass units. So it's the same idea as chlorine. So on the right-hand side, if you happen to see a spectrum that has two M plus signals like that, and they differ by two units, and they're about the same size, you probably have a bromine in your molecule. So to me, as an organic chemist, that's very much like the hydroxyl group in the IR spectrum. That's a dead giveaway. That's something you should see very quickly. Um, we move down, to, as we said here, to the, to the benzene ring. And again, we don't know the fragmentation patterns for this benzene system itself. Uh, we deal with benzene chemistry in great detail in about three weeks. But you'll see now that this can break apart into smaller signals. So you're not going to get everything out of the mass spectrum. You're going to get enough to be able to answer my problems on Friday. After we come back from uh, you know, the weekend and we get back into chapter 16, we'll add it all together. So you're not just going to see mass spec now, you're going to see it throughout the term. And it will be used as clues to be able to work out problems. Everybody happy? Lauren. Uh, not necessarily. Um, mostly yes for the type of compounds that we're dealing with. Yeah. You think about M plus 1, hydrogen, M plus 1 is, if you think about H and then D is one atomic mass unit higher, or C, C13 is one atomic mass unit higher, yeah. And actually you can see those two down here, can't you? Yeah, you can see those two shoulders next to the, the two major signals. So I, I think that mass spec is, is fairly straightforward if you understand it, its basics, its idea that you're, trying, that you're trying to work out masses. And what we're really interested in here is its use in terms of solving problems, in terms of putting answers together for unknowns. Um, here we have a much more complicated spectrum for pentane, and that's, you probably could work that out. My guess is that the, you know, the better students in here could look at that spectrum 
and give me an idea of what most of those fragments are, just by simply breaking apart carbon-carbon bonds and coming up with methyl groups, ethyl groups, propyl groups, and that's pretty much it. So I, have a go at that if you can. Now at the bottom, um, what tends to happen in the second semester is it, it kind of gets, the pressure tends to sort of um, get towards the end. We could spend a whole month or a whole week on mass spec and that would be great, but what we're really interested in is getting to the end of the chapter, or the end of the text, where we talk about biological chemistry, we talk about polymer chemistry, we talk about the application of stuff. So I'm only going to cover sort of the basic details that I think are interesting and necessary here for mass spec. And that includes not covering at the bottom the fragmentation patterns for these types of compounds. But that does not leave us at a handicap either. We will have plenty of information from NMR spectroscopy and IR to be able to cover those compounds. Okay? So we'll have four techniques, maybe five techniques, that allow us to look at any of the molecules that we're interested in in this class and have a good opinion as to what their spectroscopic properties will be. And then on the other hand, from the other direction, given those spectra, what is the compound? Are we excited for Friday? I am. It's not going to snow. Like, wake up, shovel, go to work, repeat. Yeah, okay. Now, this is something interesting that um, it's probably the one thing that we lack in the chemistry department here, which is a, a mass spectrometer that gives you uh, to the fourth decimal point. And this is something that we need to publish. The, the organic chemists need to report their mass spectra, mass spectral data to the fourth decimal point. So it's something called an accurate mass. Um, you need a high resolution mass spectrometer, which we don't have and we might get in the future. But this is all based on thinking about the look at the two compounds in the middle. You'd argue that this formula weight here is the same as that formula weight there. C5H10O adds up, without decimal places, to the same as C6H12. Well, that's okay, and that's fine if you have a low-resolution spectrometer, because chances are you'll have some other technique to be able to differentiate them. If you have a bottle of each, and you know one of them is poisonous and one of them isn't, which one is the poison? You don't know. Anybody ever seen The Princess Bride? This is where he's trying to work out which one is the poison stuff, right? If he had an infrared spectrometer, he'd be fine. He'd still be going. <laughs> what tells you the difference in these two from the infrared? If you haven't seen The Princess Bride, you must do it. Go ahead. What tells you the difference here? What technique could I use and where will it show? Infrared, there will be a nice signal for the ketone that would not show up in the alkane. So you have a method to do that, right? And we, have, we do have portable infrared spectrometers. Well, if you don't have that and you want to work out from mass spectrometry, you have to go into the decimal points, into the decimal places, because it turns out from the top, what this little uh, equa these two equations are showing you, is that even though we think of a proton being one and a neutron being one, they're not exactly the same. And if you go down to these decimal points, they are a little bit different at the end. That's not a big deal if you're thinking about you know, what you've seen so far, but in science, that's a huge deal. Down to those dec decimal points makes all the difference. And if you start adding things up like that, you're going to get different numbers for these two compounds. These two compounds at the bottom will not have exactly the same mass if you take into consideration that the protons and neutrons in each are not exactly the same. So what we've got now at the bottom is a summation of those atoms using more accurate numbers. Okay, carbon was always 12, right? That was kind of the standard. And everything else related to it. And it turns out now we do have a little bit of difference. To an organic chemist, that is a big difference. We cannot publish without those numbers. And if we're out by 10%, we have to do the experiment again. Okay. If you're out by 10% or even 5% sometimes and your numbers aren't exactly close, uh, if you're, let's say you're off by the, uh, the third decimal point is off, you've got to go do it again. Your compound maybe isn't what you think it is. So this is very important to us, maybe not so interesting to you, but it's something that um, if you go into chemistry, it's something you need to be aware of. Michael. Um, what does the periodic table say over there? 15.9994, and what does it say here? And if you round that up, it's 0.5. It's 5 at the end. Yeah? I don't know the answer to that one. Okay? I don't know that. Okay? But it does make a difference when you're talking about chemistry, when you're talking about being precise like we have to be. I can find out when I go back to the office. Okay? Okay? So with that idea, we can just sort of flesh this out with some techniques that some of you might have to use in the future. Um, I... A couple of years ago, Dr. Price, you know, Dr. Price, who runs everything in chemical engineer, chemical engineering, took us down to this chemical plant. It's, um, what's it called? The one in, if you go onto the Ohio River, it's the one that does the recycling of all the oil. You see the trucks coming up 11 all the time. They always, they always hit me, try to hit me. It's a, it's a small chemical company, but they run a processing plant where they purify crude oil, right? And what they need to do is to make sure that they have the right fractions. 
after they separated this material, they have to work out what they have in there, the right fractions. So they would have an analytical chemist on the staff whose job it might be to take the fractions of the oil each time and make sure it's the right stuff, make sure it's the same stuff, make sure it's pure, make sure it's consistent. And what we can see here is the use of something called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. You think about liquid petroleum, it's going to have low boiling points, and those boiling points will make a difference in terms of separation. You can distill those things which you've done in lab in the past. So a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer is a coupled instrument where two are put together. You've got the gas chromatograph that separates compounds based on their boiling point, and then at the end of that, the sample comes out the end of a tube into the mass spectrometer, and you can work out its molecular mass, and you can work out all its fragmentation patterns. So these coupled devices, a lot of which I think you'll probably see in the future, and you might even work with in the future, um, are very important these days. The GC mass spec is about the most inexpensive form of mass spectrometry that we have, and like I said before, a lot of law enforcement, certain, uh, certainly state level or, or certainly uh, county level uh, law enforcement will have this type of thing on hand so they can solve their own problems. And what you get at the end of this is, um, this is not a mass spectrum. This is a GC trace in which a mixture of compounds have gone through the gas chromatograph. They've separated along a column, very much like TLC that you did last year. And you end up with these patterns, and these signals. So each one of these belongs to a different compound. And if they come off the GC mass spec, they come off the GC component at different times, they can go into the mass spectrometer at different times, and you can measure their individual masses. Okay? They use this in sports, uh, for doping in the Olympics and things like that. It's a very simple, very fast, and even these days, very portable technique to be able to do that. So that's one application of mass spectrometry that you're probably aware of. Uh, this is something that is now very big, and I, I use that word carefully. Um, big molecules, biomolecules. The, the biology department really wants one of these things. Uh, the problem is they're very expensive and, expensive, and you have to really rationalize, and you have to be putting out all kinds of samples to be able to use one of these things. Uh, we tend to send ours down to Ohio State because they have these things. They, they, they have the, uh, the input, the numbers that they can use to actually, the uh, number of samples they can use. And this is a moldy TOF, um, laser desorption, ionization, time of flight mass spectrometry. This is, this is the state of the art. And you can basically take a protein or a carbohydrate, something that's very complex and is not very volatile, and you can get it into the gas phase and you can make it enter the mass spectrometer and break down very carefully. Instead of just blasting it, right, with like a 12 gauge mass spectrometer that we would use here, they're knocking off pieces every now and again. 12 gauge, football, I know, whatever. Um, they're knocking off pieces in a controlled way. And if you do that as the sample moves through the, um, moves through the mass spectrometer, you can sequence things, you can sequence proteins, you can sequence nucleic acids by doing this type of technique. So that's the state of the art. I think within, hopefully within my time here, we'll be able to get one of these things and be able to um, catch up with people. But that again is, is a very important uh, application of mass spectrometry. So to finish this off, again, context. There actually isn't much of anything new here for Friday. It's more of a let's finish off the mass spec and let's get ready for an NMR and think about where we are, take a test and then come back and carry on. Um, we're going to need to worry about, I'm going to jump ahead here a second, we're going to need to worry about this. And you'll sit there and the engineers will go, oh cool, numbers, equations. And the rest of us will sit there and go, ah oh, crap. Okay. Um, this is not as complicated as it seems. This formula will be on your exam if you need it. You don't need this on Friday. This will be the next exam and beyond when you're given a formula and you're given the spectra and your job is to come up with the unknown molecule. You haven't seen that yet. You don't know enough information yet. But you will have to work out, for example, is it an alkene? Is it a benzene ring? Some of the clues will be in the spectra, and you'll very quickly be able to pull those out and get the answers started. But this helps you get going. This is a, a measure of the degree of unsaturation. And this equation to do with the number of pi bonds and cycles is, is written in red at the top, and it's always going to be on your test if you need it. Right? So don't memorize it. Understand what it's about, but don't memorize it. Now. Going back a couple of slides to build up to that equation. What we have done in class so far is started very simply with the alkanes a while back. I said the alkanes are a kind of our feedstock material. And then what we need to do with those things is to maybe halogenate them to make alkyl halides. Then we can make alkenes and alcohols and whatever. But alkanes are the starting point. And we then built up into alkenes and alkynes. And then second semester we're into the ketones and stuff like that. And we're introducing unsaturation. Unsaturation in English is basically a double bond or a cycle. And the way you work this out, you, you can't have an unsaturated system derived from methane. You need at least two carbons. Because two carbons is the minimum you need for a pi bond. 
you'll see now that if you take out two hydrogens from this and you tie those ends together, uh, I'm sorry, you tie the, tie the two in the middle, you make a pi bond. That's easy enough. And if you go to propane, if you take out two of those hydrogens and you maybe you make a double bond in the middle or you tie the ends together, you make cyclopropane. And those now taking out two hydrogens, that's a measure of unsaturation. So what we're going to talk about is the degree of unsaturation. How many of those motifs, how many of those fragments are in the molecule? Do we have a benzene ring with four degrees of unsaturation? Do we have an alkene with one? Do we have an alkyne with two? And what we need to do today is to work out where that comes from. So there's where we start uh, in terms of the saturated molecules. We did this last semester where we talked about the general formula for an alkane is CnH2n plus 2. That was the general formula for an alkane or a simple alkyl halide belonging to that sort of family which is fully saturated. What we'll need to do today is to relate that going backwards to CnH2n. Take out two hydrogens, that could become a cycle. Hexane is related to cyclohexane by taking out two hydrogens and cyclizing it. But those two hydrogens taken out are an unsaturation. We can see here then for alkynes, what would an alkyne be? What would the formula be for an alkyne? CnH2n minus 2 for an alkyne. So we actually saw those when we did those different subjects, but now we have to put them in context and think about why it's useful here. Uh, at the bottom, we had the isomers of C5H12. They're all saturated. There are no pi bonds, there are no cycles. If you're writing things down, there's a definition. Completely saturated means no cycles, no pi bonds. That includes no ketones, no aldehydes, no carboxylic acids, no benzene rings, nothing. Every valence is taken up by a single bond to something else. That defines a saturated system. Everybody okay with that? That's the starting point. Now, looking at where we can go from there, if you take out two hydrogens from an alkane, you can make an alkene. And so now we can see that this molecule at the top left is now unsaturated. So in this case, it's said to have one degree of unsaturation, one pi bond. If you went to an alkyne by taking out two more hydrogens on those two adjacent carbons, you would now have two degrees of unsaturation. So the two pi bonds count for two degrees of unsaturation. Where this becomes useful is a very quick gauge of where you need to be, given a whole bunch of data, NMR, mass spec, IR, all this stuff that you'll see on the second exam onwards, and your job is to work out the compound. What is it? You need, some, you need some handle. You need some place to get into the problem. In this case, we've got to be aware that double bonds also relate to the cycles. Because to get to one hexene from hexane, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's hexane. To get to hexene, I take out two hydrogens from the adjacent carbons at the end in this example, and that gives me hexene. That's one degree of unsaturation. If I want to get to hex, the cyclohexane, I take out two hydrogens from the end, remove those two, tie those two atoms together, the two carbons, and that gives me a cycle. Obviously, chemically, a cycle is not the same as an alkene. But in terms of using this concept, yes. And you'll be asking yourself, OK, how many cycles do I have? How many alkenes do I have based on this input? Bottom, this is where you need to be. Not necessarily for Friday. Okay, I'm going to put the homework up for 15, probably, I don't know, when I get my car back. Um, maybe tomorrow, maybe, maybe Friday. Uh, it'll be due next week, so you, you have a chance to do it over the weekend. Um, this will be on there, and then this will be necessary for what's to come up later. So at the bottom, I have two degrees of unsaturation in this compound because I have two pi bonds. Likewise here, one pi bond, two pi bonds, that means two degrees of unsaturation. Here, two. Here, two. Now, over here... I'm cycled twice, right? Two rings put together. I've got two rings next to each other. I'm going to say that we have two cycles, so two degrees of unsaturation. On the right-hand side, why do I have two unsaturations there? It's a cycle and a pi bond, right? One of each. So that counts the same way. Likewise here and here, and at the end, one pi bond, one cycle. So a degree of unsaturation is either a pi bond or it's a cycle, and obviously you've seen molecules in which you can have both. Any comments, any questions? Everybody at the back all right? Jessica, one. Two pi bonds. That's right. That's right. Jessica, two at the back. You okay? All right. Very good. So we build up, build up to this, and you will see where this becomes useful practicing problems. Again, don't memorize it. Like, the, like the, uh, the spec sheet, don't memorize it. Know how to use it, and you'll be fine. 
shouldn't be any problems with this. Uh, number of carbons is obvious. Number of hydrogens is obvious. X is either is a halogen, and N is a nitrogen. And that will help you every time, especially if you work into the later compounds like nitriles and cycles and things like that. Benzene nitrile, that might have five or six degrees of unsaturation. And being able to get those first thoughts down when you're solving a problem is, is quite helpful and quite speedy. I'll show you that again when we get through the, mass, the NMR stuff. Here's some examples. On the left, you've got cyclohexane. How many degrees of unsaturation over here? One. Okay, one cycle. What about here? Four. Three double bonds. They look like double bonds so far. And one cycle. What about over here? One. That's as simple as it gets. You can recognize them quite quickly, and then you can work backwards and calculate them when you need to. Okay? That will be, that will be fun. Now, that's the end of that chapter. Does anybody want to say anything about mass spectrometry? If you want to try mass spec, go talk to Dr. Lescu. No, that was what I said about depth. Depth. We have enough right now to be able to solve the problems that we are concerned about. And, and let's, be, let's be straight, you know, we haven't covered the means yet, right? But we will have plenty of information. By next week, you will have so much information, you won't, you'll be so happy. Okay, information is everything. Carl, you all right? Good man. Okay, so I'm done with that chapter, and whoa, as if I was prepared, I have the next chapter. Look at that. 20 minutes of this stuff, get it started, then next Monday we come back, you've had the weekend off, we've refreshed, and we get cracking on this stuff. This is the technique, as far as we are concerned. Infrared's great, mass spec is great, but as far as an organic chemist is concerned, certainly a, mass, a, a person who makes molecules for a living, this is the best one. Nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. I have a lot of slides in this chapter. It's a big one. Now, this is a technique that some of you probably know about, some of you have probably already done it, and some of you have probably already been the sample in one of these things. Yeah? It's MRI. It's exactly the same thing as an MRI. If you've had an MRI in your life, you have been the sample in one of these experiments. We talk about small samples. We're talking about you know milligrams of a compound, but you, this is exactly the same technique. Um, the reason there's a difference in the names, if you use the word nuclear in front of a patient, they tend to get upset. Okay, so they, they were careful here and they changed the name. It's exactly the same. Now, YSU, um, I guess my contribution to the sort of growing part of the, the department up there in chemistry was, was getting money in for these spectrometers uh, about five years ago now. And uh, we have a really nice NMR lab. If you want to see this, ask, and we'll, we'll show you in there. About half a million dollars worth of instrumentation in there, and students have free access to it. I don't even know my password anymore. I don't bother. Uh, the students do all the work. Um, the, t the technique here is abbreviated NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. And again, it's a, it's a, a spectroscopy, I think, because we get the sample back. And we have two of these things in the building over there, uh, both of them at the 300 megahertz level. Um, it says 400 there, doesn't it? No, they are 400. That's right. Uh, the size will make a difference. If you have a 900 megahertz, that means Case Western, it means Ohio State, it means Harvard, places like that. Uh, but 400 and two of them is, is pretty impressive for a place like this. So let's get into this and, and talk about some basics. Again, if you want to draw a line under where you're responsible for Friday, this would be it. This is getting stuff out of the way, so I'm not wasting time. And then at the end of the, two, end of the semester, we're talking about more interesting stuff because we have that time back. Um, so it, the word is nuclear. In IR, we talked about bonds. We talked about functional groups. In mass spectrometry, we talked about a molecule breaking apart because we were blasting it with electrons. Different incident radiations or different, let's say, uh, excitations that are taking, uh, taking place. In NMR, the word is a giveaway. It's all about the nucleus or nuclei. And we'll deal mainly with proton and carbon, which is obviously important because we are talking about uh, organic molecules. But it also works for fluorine. And it also works for phosphorus. If you want to learn about those, Dr. Jackson's the expert. Now, it turns out that nuclei are very much like magnets in that they have poles. And if you put them in a magnetic field, they respond to that magnetic field. And if you ever played with these bar magnets as a kid, does everybody, everybody do this? Or is this an old thing for old people? Right? You play with magnets as a kid. And the idea is if you put the light poles together, they repel. And if you put the opposite poles together, they stick. Right? Now, those are two energy states. That's like peer sitting down and peer standing up. One of them's high energy where they're repelling, one of them's low energy where they're sticking together. It's as simple as that. And what we'll do is excite these protons from one energy state to the next and measure the energy it took. 
and that will manifest itself on a graph, on a chart that, that looks like an NMR spectrum. So this is about nuclear magnetism. We'll start off with proton, and then when we get into more of this in depth next week, we'll do carbon-13. Now, what happens to a magnet if you put it next to a big magnet? And that's what we do. If you look at the can, right, this is the can, and this is the other can. One is a robot, one is a, a regular uh, single sample. That can is a big magnet. And you're putting into that magnet little nuclei, little magnets. So in nature and in reality, these magnets are just like, hey, whatever, blah, they're spinning around all over the place. Any direction you want. That's the diagram on the left, right? Free to rotate in any direction they want. But if you put these things in the presence of a big magnet, they do what they're told. And they really only have two ways of orientating themselves in that big magnet, either with or against that big magnet, yeah? Now, that's exactly like the small magnets, like repel, opposite, attract, two different energy states. So my picture on the right is trying to show those two energy states. I have my magnetic sample, my magnetic field sticking up in the middle, right, B0. That's the big magnet, and that's the direction of it. You don't even have to have any physics for this. It's, it's simple. The magnets will go from being all over the place to being lined up in an orderly way. And most of them will line up with the field. So I've got this one lining up with the field, that one with the field, that one with the field, and there's always some difficult ones, right? There's always the Sammy P ringtones of the nuclear magnetic world, and they will go against the, the flow, and they will, they will line themselves up against. Now, which do you think is higher energy and which is lower energy? With the field is low, and against the field is high. We've got two states. All we're going to do is flip between them and measure how much energy it took. So that's basically what happens. There's your two energy states at the bottom, with the field at the top, against the field. And what we will do in the next couple of weeks, next couple of days, is take this nucleus and kick it up to that higher energy state. So what do I need for that? I need energy. Next question is, where does the energy come from? It doesn't work in the infrared, and it's a different part of the spectrum. We're going to use radio waves. In this case, there's a picture from the textbook that you've got. Uh, I prefer the first picture. This is a little bit too, uh, too sort of uh, confusing for me. That's the same picture as that one. This is the one in your textbook. Random, ordered either with or against. This is about nuclei so far, and nuclei are behaving as magnets in the presence of a big magnet. You stuck your sample into the big magnet. Now, as the magnetic field gets larger, the physics behind this, don't worry about it, but as the magnetic field gets larger, the gap between those two energy levels gets larger. What that means to us in reality is, is resolution. All right, so we're going to talk about megahertz. We're going to talk about the size of the instrument and the, the field and the uh, radiation that's needed to actually make this work. When I was in school uh, at this level, uh, sophomore, we had a 60 megahertz instrument. This was about the size of this table, and it was a table, right? And in graduate school, we got access to a 300 megahertz, so that was a big leap, and that gives you a huge amount of detail. And then postdoc in DC, we were looking at 500 megahertz. And then back here at, high, at, at YSU, 400 megahertz is about right for what we do. But you go to Case, you go to Pitt, you go to Carnegie Mellon, they're looking at 800 megahertz, 900 megahertz, and medical schools might have a gigahertz. And this is, this is now the size makes a difference in terms of the, what you can see in the spectrum, but it also makes a difference in the size of the instrument. If you look at these instruments in the, the lab that we have, the 400 megahertz is taller than me. I'm six foot two and a bit. They're taller than me, so I have to reach up and put the sample in. If you're building a gigahertz instrument, which people are doing these days, you have to build a building around the instrument. Yeah? This is, we saw this in NIH a few years ago, so my wife was there as a, as a PhD student. They build the building around the instrument. It's just so big, right? You, and it, guess where it is in the, in the building? It's in the basement, <laughs> yeah. And you think about geology and things that, you know, things tend to rattle now and again. It's in the basement, and it's made to be as steady as it possibly can be. This is a big deal. So if you're looking at a gigahertz instrument, you need to go to one of the bigger schools, especially in the biomedical fields. This is now starting to be useful for protein uh, analysis. So there's the basic sort of diagram for what's going on here. Um, the big cylinders are the magnets. You've put your sample in the magnetic field. It goes into a six-inch little glass tube into the field. It's now a liquid in the field. And what we need to do is excite it, or else the molecules will just stay where they are. We need to give them a kick. We need to sort of put some energy in so that we can go from the bottom energy level to the top energy level and measure the differences in that level. So here we can see a coil. And that coil is how we generate a radio frequency. 
Now, the history to this is kind of interesting. It was a physics experiment. I think it was a physics experiment, which was serendipitous. They didn't actually find out what they wanted to find out when they were trying to do this. But all of a sudden, it was like rev it revolutionized organic chemistry because we can use this to work out organic molecule structure. And I, I guess it would revolutionize medicine to a sense because now you had MRI. Those techniques came from this. So it turns out now the radio frequency uh, sort of component of the spectrum that we talked about last time is the appropriate spectrum or part of it to actually do this, to, act, to sort of energize the protons or the, or the nuclei in general from the bottom energy level to the top energy level. Now you might be thinking, all right, if I have a molecule like CH4 and I've got a hydrogen there and they're all the same, how many signals will I see? One. They're all the same. Okay, I'll see one signal. And if you went to propane, this is where we come back next Monday. How many, expect, how many signals do you expect to see? Two. Now, maybe people have been reading ahead, or they're starting to see chemical differences. Some are secondary hydrogen, some are primary. But they're also magnetically different. And they're in different magnetic fields and different magnetic environments. So they will show at different places. And that's very useful. If hydrogen only showed one signal for every hydrogen, this would be completely useless. You get a spectrum the same for every molecule, and that's useless. But it turns out they show in different places, and that different place will be on, the, on a graph, on a chart. The actual instrument looks a lot like this. Um, magnets have changed their shape over the years. They, they, they typically look like a can. Uh, some of them used to look like R2-D2 from Star, Star Wars. Um, now the ones are pretty straightforward. These are these, these ultra-shield type systems in which um, you used to have to take out your wallet. I've done this many times. If you forget to take out your wallet and you walk up to the old instrument, your wallet was, you know, all your cards in your wallet were wiped. It was a mess. You had to get new, new um, cards. But nowadays they have these ultra shield systems, which we have up in the Ward Beecher, in which you can get close enough. If you had any sort of implant, if you had a heart implant, stuff like that, you're warned to stay away from these things because it will mess with it. Not so bad these days. Now, here's how you make a sample. This is just getting the basics out of the way. We won't do any spectra today. We won't do any sort of analysis today. This is getting the basics out of the way. We need to set the experiment up. And those of you who are doing honors will do this. And those of you who are interested in doing this, ask and we can show you how it works. I'll be quite happy to let you have a go on the instrument. Um, we need to have some solvent, because our sample right there usually isn't neat. And what I mean by neat is like in the infrared spectrum that you took or are taking this week, where you just take a drop of the liquid. That's a neat liquid. There's nothing else in there. It's not cut with anything. In this case, we have to dilute things down. And we need some solvents that are not going to show up in the spectrum. So in the infrared spectrum, we use the plates, the salt plates, because they're blank. They don't show up in the spectrum. In NMR spectroscopy, we have to use something called a deuterated solvent, in which maybe a hydrogen has been replaced by a D. And it turns out H shows up in the spectrum, D does not. D is completely blank to NMR spectroscopy. It's not magnetically active. So if you do research in, the, in chemistry, many of you will deal with chloroform D. It is the deuterated version of chloroform, which is CHCl3. You replace the H with a D, and now you have an NMR blank solvent. So it doesn't show in the spectrum, which is good. You can also use methylene chloride with D2. That's a bit more expensive. We don't use that so much. This is very useful if you need a very polar solvent, uh, acetonitrile D3, and then benzene D6. Very, very useful. These are all the same solubility properties that you would have for the regular organic solvent, but now they're blank to the NMR spectrum. And if you're doing biochemistry, which many of you will do in the future, D2O, the deuterated version of water. That's very, very useful to be able to dissolve at biological molecules. To make the sample, you put it in a glass tube. And these glass tubes, are, they're not cheap. My students seem to think they're disposable or they can eat them. I don't know what happens to them. Uh, but they tend to disappear quite quickly. They're quite fragile. And we want to get them back. It's a six inch long glass tube, I don't know, two or three, four millimeters across. And uh, that's your sample. And once you've got that, you take a depth gauge, you measure the depth, because you want that sample to be right in the right place. This magnet has internal what we call shims. Now, if you've ever done any woodwork, you know what shims are, right? Yeah, if you ever put a window in or a door in shims to make sure that you get exactly the right place, you put a small piece of wood in there to make sure it's in exactly the right place. We have shim magnets, so that the big field is then manipulated slightly in a local sense so that you have exactly a uniform field around the sample. That's incredibly important so you get a good spectrum. Okay? Um, and then you get your local seven foot jolly green giant to come along um, and pop this thing in the NMR spectrometer and we have an experiment. And you run the experiment and you get a spectrum. Again, ask me if you want to do it. It's great. It's, it's a nice instrument.
That's what the chart looks like. By next week, this is where we will be in great detail. And I would argue that this, you know, some of those IR specs are contained in great detail as much as they did here. But here we have shapes and here we have patterns. And here we have definite places where signals are showing up because not all hydrogens are the same. And this molecule is morphine. And if you want to know what morphine looks like, there's the structure. It's fairly complicated, and it has many different types of proton. Protons on hydroxyls, protons on carbons, protons on benzene rings, and they all show up in set places. So we'll get the IR out the way on Friday, we'll get the mass spec out the way on Friday, then we'll come back and we'll do the, the NMR, because this stuff is way more complicated. In terms of where we are, and then I'll give you a couple of words about Friday and what to expect, IR is all about types of functional groups, carbonyls, hydroxyls, double bonds, benzene rings, stuff like that. Not too tricky. In terms of NMR, it's all about the types of proton, the types of carbon, the number of them, and their local environment. Okay? The local environment. So very quickly, we'll just, you know, without looking at graphs, we'll finish this off because it's out of the way, then we can deal with graphs on Monday. The hardest thing to do with this is to identify which protons are not the same. Surely every H is the same. No, it's not. The reason will be because electrons are also magnetic, and if you have different types of bonds around, you have different types of electrons or different numbers of electrons, and you get different magnetic environments. So in this molecule, going back to things like symmetry, going back to things like R and S, is that middle carbon chiral? No, of course not. And if it's not chiral, we would use the word symmetrical. And we'll use the same word here, it's symmetrical. So that will tell me, all right, no doubt, these protons on that methyl group are the same as these protons on this methyl group in propane. And as importantly, what's the relationship between this proton and that proton? They're the same, right? They're equivalent. So I'll use the term magnetically equivalent. If they're magnetically equivalent, they show at the same place in the spectrum. So we would see two signals. One signal for the CH2 and the separate signal for the CH3. You do not see separate signals for both CH3s. They're identical, they show at the same place, at the same frequency. That equivalence test is something you should, you know, if I was doing something before class on Monday, this would be it. Look at this equivalence test and decide what's going to be a signal and what's going to be a different signal. In this molecule, what is the relationship between that proton and that proton? They're the same, yeah? There's a mirror plane through there, they're definitely the same. What is the relationship between this methyl signal and that methyl signal? They're the same, because they are you know, equivalent. Now, go to this one on the right-hand side. What is the relationship between those two? They are the same. If I change this for a chlorine, maybe that will be a little bit different. That's a little bit later. In the cyclopropane here, what's the relationship between that and that? They're the same. Now, what operation must you do to prove that they're the same in terms of moving it in space? What operation do you need to do for that cyclopropane to prove they're the same? Turn it over. Yeah? Turn it over. Think about doing meso last year. Meso is way more complicated than this. Think about doing diastereomers versus enantiomers. That's way more complicated than this stuff. So if I turn that cyclopropane over, the wedged H becomes the dashed H. They're the same thing. They show at the same place in the spectrum. Now, down at the bottom, all of a sudden, uh, we've got to make things a bit more complicated. And we do something called a replacement test. This will become more obvious when we see, see more complicated systems. If I replace this with a D, I get that. What is D? Deuterium, H2. If I replace down here with a D, I get that. If you turn this thing over 180 degrees in the vertical, they're the same thing. You did that already, right? Most of you saw that already. But as you get to more complicated systems, this becomes important. So looking at these systems now, we have ethanol. This will be very important when you get to biochem in the future. The hydrogens on the methyl group are all the same. You'll see one signal. But the hydrogens over here now maybe are a little bit different. They're related as being called enantiotopic. And what that means is, if I replace, if I put an H there and I replace this with a D, this carbon becomes chiral. This is a theor theoretical thing in your head or on a piece of paper. That molecule becomes chiral, and that carbon is a chiral center. And if you do the opposite of that, and you put the D at the back and the H at the front, What's the relationship between those two molecules that I just theoretically made? They're enantiomers. They're enantiomers. So that says that those two protons are now 
related as enantiotopic. But just to make a mess of that, what are the physical properties of enantiomers? The same. So this, they show at the same place. What type of molecule do I need to get to to make them different? What's the word for something that had, it was a stereoisomer, but it wasn't an enantiomer, it had different properties. What was that? Diastereomers. So the next word would be diastereotopic. This can be kind of tricky. So down at the bottom, no doubt, these two are enantiotopic. They'll show at the same place, but that can get confusing later. This is not symmetrical through the middle, so these two are different. They are enantiotopic and therefore equivalent. Now, diastereotopic, I'm going to look at this. This will be the first thing I'll talk about on Monday when we come back from the exam. This can be quite tricky. I have a methyl group here which is unique and a methyl group here which is unique in terms of where it shows in the NMR spectrum. I have a hydroxyl, unique. I have an H, unique. But these two here, it's a, it's a regular CH2 group, but is it? In a biological molecule like this, it's not as simple as it looks. If I do this replacement test and I put the D on the left, which is this molecule, I get that. If I put the D on the right, I get that. They're no longer in antimus because this does not match. You see, there's no mirror relationship between that top carbon and its stereocenter. If so, if these are diastereomers, those protons are said here and here to be diastereotopic, and they don't show the same. And we'll see examples of that with carbohydrates and amino acids later on, which is very useful in terms of things like biochemistry. Now, Friday, be here on time. I aim to give you as much time as I can. There is a class in here afterwards, so we have to be gone as soon as we can. Uh, between now and then, get any problems solved. This is a very good exam to do well on, because the next one is full of this stuff. Have a nice day.